Good evening. Thank you so much for joining this evening's webinar by Compassion in World Farming, where we'll be asking the question, is the next pandemic on our plate? My name is Philip Limbury. I'm proud to be the, the Chief Executive of Compassion in World Farming. And our guest uh, this evening, our guest speaker will be Peter Stevenson, Compassion in World Farming's Chief Policy Officer, who will be talking about uh, uh, how uh, the research has been going into the pandemic and what we can do about it. Thank you so much for those that have submitted questions in advance. I'll be putting your questions to Peter as many as time will allow and getting to the root of the issue. And this is the first time we've been we've hosted a, an online event like this, so uh, your feedback will be very welcome. Uh, and if you have any further points that you would like us to address after this, we'll be sending round uh, a, an email to all in t attendees, uh, which you can then respond to. For those that don't know so much about Compassion in World Farming, uh, the organisation was founded more than 50 years ago now by a dairy farming couple called Peter and Anna Roberts. They became increasingly concerned at the rise of factory farming and animals being caged, crammed and confined uh, and kept in conditions that can only be described as of utter deprivation. They gave up uh, dairy farming. They started Compassion in World Farming. Uh, and Peter Roberts, who led the organisation for many years, for 25 years, uh, he felt that of all the things that would be the undoing of this factory farm regime, it would be disease. And perhaps we're starting to see uh, the early signs of that undoing happening right before our eyes. COVID-19, of course, has been linked to the illegal wildlife trade and the consumption of wildlife. But nevertheless, factory farming provides the perfect breeding ground for new and more deadly versions of disease. We've seen it in the very recent past. Look at highly pathogenic avian influenza. Swine flu which came out of the Americas, out of intensive pig farming in, in, uh, in, in Mexico. Avian influenza, the, two, the 2009 pandemic uh, affected 180 countries in the first year and killed up to half a million people. Serious stuff. So that is why we're asking the question, what do we need to do with food and farming through the lens of COVID-19. Surely we need to avoid going back to normal. We need a new normal, a reset, where animals are treated with compassion and respect. It's not just the caging, cramming and confining farm animals. It's also the runaway meat and dairy industry. We only have to look at the fact that half the habitable land surface of the planet is producing food. Of that, 80% is devoted to meat and dairy. As demand for meat and dairy products continues to increase around the world, so we encroach on the remaining wildlands of the world, forests and other wonderful environments, wiping away the wildlife, shaking free novel viruses, exposing global public health to huge risk. What we can see through COVID-19 is that, yes, we are all in this together and that for us to properly protect people, we have to protect animals too. So this evening is about asking the question, is the next pandemic on our plate? And someone who's done a good deal of research on this is our guest speaker for this evening. Peter Stevenson is Compassion in World Farming's Chief Policy Advisor. He studied economics and law at Trinity College, Cambridge. 
He's a solicitor, a former theatre director with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and now lives in Scotland with Annie, his wife, and two wonderful rescue dogs, Frankie and Rufa. To tell us more about his new report, is the next pandemic on our plate? I'm pleased to welcome Peter Stevenson. Thank you, Philip. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, the uh, COVID crisis gives us a real opportunity to press for a radical transformation of our food system and in particular um, for a move away from factory farming. There are calls rightly for the uh, Asian wet markets to be phased out, but there's a danger they'll be replaced not by uh, humane, sustainable farming, but by factory farms. And with deepening economic recession in the West, we are likely to be told that factory farming plays an important part in providing cheap food. But the stressful, crowded conditions of industrial animal production contribute to the emergence spread and amplification of pathogens, some of which are zoonotic. A joint scientific opinion by the uh, European Medicines Agency and the European Food Safety Authority has said that the, the stressful conditions of intensive indoor large-scale production may lead to an increased risk of livestock contracting disease. Um, and as Philip said, the last global pandemic was the 2009 swine flu uh, pandemic. Um, pigs can be infected by avian influenza viruses, human influenza viruses and pig influenza viruses. And they act like a, a mixing vessel in which the genes uh, from these various viruses uh, can be swapped and new viruses that are a mix of human, bird and pig viruses can emerge. And this is the process that seems to have been behind the 2009 swine flu pandemic, which uh, started in La Gloria, Mexico, just five miles from a major concentration of industrial pig farms. The 1999 Nipah virus uh, in Malaysia was associated with the increasing size and intensity of commercial pig farms and their encroachment into forested areas. And the virus appears to have jumped from fruit bats to pigs and then from then to people. The coronavirus, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 does not, as far as we currently know, infect pigs. Um, but other coronaviruses are circulating in pigs and can cause them serious disease. In 2017, in China, a virus was transmitted from bats to pigs, and this led to the death of 25,000 piglets. This was known as swine acute diarrhea syndrome. Um, and scientists warn that such viruses could in future be transmitted from pigs to people. The intensive poultry sector likes to claim that uh, avian influenza, bird flu, uh, is spread by wild birds. But the bird flu that is circulating naturally among wild birds is generally of low pathogenicity. Um, it, it usually will do them little harm. It's when these viruses get into industrial poultry sheds that low pathogenic avian influenza can uh, be converted into dangerous high pathogenic avian influenza. 
industrial poultry production in which thousands of birds are packed into a shed gives the virus a constant supply of new hosts. It's able to move very quickly among the birds, perhaps mutating as it does so. And in this situation, highly virulent new strains can emerge. <clears throat> Industrial production can also have an indirect impact on the emergence of new viruses. Industrial animal agriculture needs huge quantities of cereals and soy to feed the animals. And this leads to the expansion of cropland into forests and other wildlife habitats. Factory farms themselves are sometimes built near forests. And this closer contact between people and wildlife can lead to uh, the, the transmission of viruses from wild animals to people. As I said, industrial uh, animal farming needs huge quantities of cereals to feed the animals. 57% of EU cereals are used as animal feed. Globally, the figure is 40%. And this undermines food security as these animals convert cereals very inefficiently into meat and milk. For every 100 calories of human edible cereals fed to animals, just 17 to 30 calories enter the human food chain as meat or milk. For every 100 grams of protein in human edible cereals fed to animals, just 43 grams of protein into the human food chain as meat or milk. And industrial livestock's huge demand for, for cereals has led not just to the expansion of farmland, but to the intensification of crop production, which with its monocultures and agrochemicals has led to soil degradation, overuse and pollution of water, and biodiversity loss. Now, if we're going to tackle these problems and achieve much better animal welfare, we're going to have to move to new forms of farming that, that work with the grain of nature. Uh, we need to um, uh, redefine the role of livestock. Uh, studies show that animals are only efficient when they're converting materials we can't consume into food we can eat. So efficient ways of animals include uh, raising them extensively on pasture or other grassland, or feeding them on crop residues or byproducts such as brewers' grains and citrus pulp, or unavoidable food waste such as leftover bakery products and cull vegetables and fruit. Now, if we were to only feed animals in this way, there would be about a 50% reduction in livestock production. And that would uh, achieve big reductions in the use of resources and in, and in environmental damage. If you look at the the, the far right column here, you'll see that a 50% reduction in livestock production would lead to big reduction in the use of arable land, water, energy, pesticides, fertilizers, and a big decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, deforestation, and soil erosion. Secondly, uh, we need to move to uh, regenerative agriculture, such as agroecology. This is able to minimise the use of pesticides and fertilisers, while at the same time enhancing productivity. And it can do this by supporting and, and harnessing natural processes. It can build soil quality through the use of compost, animal manure, cover crops, green manure, and the use of rotations that include nitrogen, that include legumes, 
that can fix atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. And agroecology can minimise uh, pests and plant diseases through integrated uh, pest management. For example, by allowing the natural enemies of pests to thrive while pesticides usually kill them. And by developing healthy soils that are able to promote strong, healthy plants that are better able to withstand uh, disease and pest attacks. And by using rotations which can impede the buildup of pathogens and pests that often occur when one plant is continuously cropped. And agroecology can restore biodiversity. Uh, it can enable farmland birds, pollinators, butterflies and wildlife to flourish once again. <clears throat> we also need to uh, restore the link between animals and the land through rotational integrated crop livestock systems. This is a classic seven year rotation. Year one wheat, two barley, three oats. Years four to seven grazing. Um, and in these systems, animals are fed on, on, on grass and crop residues and food waste. And of course, they can enjoy really high welfare standards. And in the grazing part of the rotation, soil quality is built through the animal's mature, manure, but also the ability of the roots of grasses to collect minerals from deep in the soil. And through the inclusion in the sward of protein rich leguminous plants, such as clover. Uh, and all this means that the arable part of the rotation can be carried out without the use of nitrogen fertilizers, which cause so much pollution. Industrial livestock production is dependent on the routine use of antibiotics to prevent the bacterial diseases that are inevitable when animals uh, are kept in poor condition. This leads uh, to the emergence of antibiotic resistance in the animals, which can then be transferred to people, so undermining the, an the efficacy of the antibiotics, which are so important in human medicine. If we want to minimise the risk of disease and to save our antibiotics, we need to move to health oriented systems for rearing animals. Systems in which uh, good health is inherent in the farming method rather than being propped up by routine antibiotics use. So what would these health oriented systems look like? Well, they would avoid overcrowding uh, as this uh, contributes to the emergence and amplification of pathogens. They would minimise stress as stress undermines animals' uh, immune system, making them vulnerable to disease. They would ensure that animals can engage in their natural behaviours um, because if they, the inability to do so is highly stressful. There would be no early weaning of pigs as this involves several stressors, including premature separation from the sow, uh, mixing with unfamiliar pigs, having to get used to new diets and new housing. These systems would avoid excessive herd and flock size, as these can accelerate the spread of pathogens. They would avoid mixing of unfamiliar animals. They would maintain good air quality, uh, such as low levels of ammonia, dust and carbon dioxide, as poor air quality leads to respiratory disease. And crucially, they wouldn't use animals genetically selected for fast growth and high yields as these entail immunological problems. Now, these systems wouldn't just produce healthy animals, 
but would also produce first class animal welfare. COVID-19 suggests that we need to rethink our relationship with the natural world and treat it and the creatures within it with much more respect. But to accomplish this, we need to adopt a fresh approach to economics. Our current economics model focuses on gross domestic product, which is a, a crude way of measuring progress. We need to move to a more nuanced system, such as donut economics. The outer rim sets out the planetary boundaries, such as those for climate change and biodiversity loss, that we must not overshoot. And the inner circle contains societal objectives, such as social justice, good health, nutritious food, where we must not fall short. And having to consider all the elements of the donut helps us assess whether proposed economic activities are going to harm the planet and whether they're going to contribute to or detract from key social objectives. It's really a, it's an excellent model for charting our post-COVID future. I've got just one concern. Within its 21 planetary boundaries and societal objectives, the donut finds no room for animal well-being. We propose the addition of a 22nd element to the donut, good animal welfare. The low cost of animal products has been achieved by an economic sleight of hand. We've devised a distorting form of economics that takes account of some costs, such as housing and feeding animals, while ignoring other costs, such as the detrimental impact of industrial agriculture on natural resources and our health. And this has been recognised by the UN Food and Agriculture Organisation, which has said that in many countries there's a worrying disconnect between the retail price of food and the true cost of its production. Um, and that as a result, food produced at great environmental cost in the form of greenhouse gas emissions, air and water pollution and habitat destruction may appear to be cheaper than more sustainably produced alternatives. <coughs> Economists refer to these negative impacts as uh, negative externalities. Um, but these externalities are not reflected in the price paid by farmers for the inputs of industrial agriculture or in the price paid by consumers of livestock products. These costs are borne by taxpayers or third parties. In some cases, the costs are borne by no one and uh, key resources such as soils and biodiversity are allowed to deteriorate, uh, so undermining the ability of future generations to feed themselves. Olivier de Schutter, former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, has said that any society in which a healthy diet is more expensive than an unhealthy diet is a society that must mend its price system. Uh, surely the same applies to any society where food produced in ways that respects natural resources and animal well-being is more expensive than environmentally damaging low animal welfare food. So how can we mend our price system and internalise negative externalities? Well, we could place taxes on unhealthy, inhumane food produced in environmentally damaging ways, and we could use all of the revenue raised by these taxes to reduce the cost of 
healthy, humane, sustainable food. And we should also ensure that such food is zero rated for that. Turning to farmers, uh, we should repurpose existing subsidies so that they're used to support farmers who are producing healthy, humane, sustainable food. And we should further support such farmers with tax breaks. We should provide them with generous capital allowances for when they're calculating net profits for tax purposes. And we should give them an extra tranche of tax-free income. And these tax breaks could be paid for out of the revenue raised by placing taxes uh, upon the inputs of industrial agriculture, such as agrochemicals. There are a number of lock-ins which make it hard to change our food system. I want to look at two of them. The industrial sector uh, says that we need to produce 60% more food to feed the growing world population and that accordingly we have no choice but to continue with industrial agriculture. And it's estimated the world population will be 9.7 billion by 2050. But we already produce enough food to feed much more than 9.7 billion people. The only problem is that over half of it is lost or wasted. We could readily feed the world population without increasing production, provided that we halve all forms of food waste, including the food loss involved in feeding human edible cereals to animals and in overconsumption. In other words, in eating more than is needed to meet our nutritional requirements. A handful of multinationals shape and control global agriculture. They supply the inputs needed by uh, industrial farming. They provide chemical pesticides and fertilizers and commercial hybrid seeds. They provide animal pharmaceuticals, including antibiotics and animal genetics, such as fast growing chickens and high yielding cows. They provide all the equipment needed by industrial farming, including the cages and crates used to confine factory farming factory farmed animals and they they include the big global grain traders who provide the uh, cereals and soy used to feed factory farmed animals. Now the, the business model of these multinationals is totally dependent on industrial agriculture. If we moved to extensive agriculture they would find demand from their for their products falling away dramatically. So they use their immense power to influence government and to uh, prevent reform, block reform. Uh, they're able to shape the narratives that entrench the status quo, such as that industrial farming provides cheap food and is vital to feed the world. Uh, the World Health Organization and Hilal Elva, the current UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, have stressed that governments must find the courage to challenge these vested interests. In conclusion, we really do have a great opportunity to achieve far reaching reforms. We need to press for a food system that provides nutritious food for all, including the most disadvantaged, and that helps us meet the Paris climate targets, which is going to mean a big, mean a big reduction in consumption of meat and dairy. We need a food system that rather than damaging the environment, restores soils and biodiver biodiversity and returns forests and uh, 
and other wildlife habitat to wild creatures. We need to move to regenerative agriculture and in order to minimise disease risk and save our antibiotics to health oriented systems for rearing animals. And of course, we must press for much higher standards of animal welfare. We have an ethical responsibility to rethink our relationship with farm animals. They've not been placed in this world simply for our convenience. They're not pieces of machinery that can be fine tuned to be ever more productive. Rather, there are fellow creatures entitled like us to experience the joy of living. Thank you very much. Peter, Peter thank, you, thank so you so much. much. That's, That's wonderful, wonderful to, to, to hear yeah. a first class <coughs> over like that. Like it really, really does, does give us, us a, a, a sense, sense of the scale, scale of the problem, of the problem and what we, what need, we to need to do. Um, Peter, um, Peter, you've been working with this issue for the last 30 years. Um, you, we've seen that we've seen that your scientists are warning that we've got 10 years, not much more than that, to solve climate change. Pollinators that we need for the very existence of a third of all of our food are you know, disappearing around the world. We see that antibiotics are losing their efficacy. 73% uh, of the world's antibiotics are now fed to farmed animals. It used to be half, it's now up to nearly three quarters. At the same time, the fish are being taken out of the sea, a, you know, a, a sizable portion of that to feed factory farmed animals. And then as you rightly were talking about, our soils are becoming depleted and disappearing around the world. Uh, you know, so all, and at the intersection of all of these global issues is our food and the way we produce it, industrial agriculture, the factory farm, farming of animals. In this COVID moment, after three decades of working on this issue, Peter, are we making progress? Yes, we, we are making uh very considerable progress, but that's not to underestimate the the the, the 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 difficulties and challenges that we that we still face. Uh, I remember, I mean, certainly for, for for example, on the animal welfare front, as as you know, we, we've you know we we've managed to get EU wide bans on battery cages and sow stalls and veal crates. Um, but we've also got to the point, both in the UK and the and the EU, and now just really possibly in these recent COVID weeks with the big, you know, UN international bodies, when there's a recognition that it is, as you've said, industrial agriculture, and particularly the livestock side of it, that is such a key driver of you know, soil degradation, biodiversity loss, climate change, risks using our antibiotics and now this recognition that 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 it's not just wild animal markets but factory farming that that that, that is such a big disease risk so yes i think we are making real progress but yes there's also a long way still to go uh, to me it seems that uh, covid-19 has given us a not so much a warning, but a demonstration of the fragility of our society, how you know, in a heartbeat, uh, the whole world can be turned upside down for billions of people and that uh, your life can change. Uh, we've, we, we are as a as a uh, as a global community, you know, facing hard times. And of course, that is felt at Compassion in World Farming. And uh, you know, we all are really appreciative of the, the way that our supporters are sticking with the cause of ending factory farming and uh, you know, helping us all get through this in stronger voice uh, and to be able to be that standard bear for a better day for people and for animals. I want to turn, Peter, to some of the questions that uh, have been sent in. One of those is uh, about uh, animals that are kept in the way that you and I would like to be like for them to be.
kept extensively where they're healthier physically and mentally than those in factory farms. But are they more at risk of disease? You know, they're outside. They're not in these barns. The industry tell us that these barns are biosecure. <laughs> What's the reality? Are the animals outside? Are my hens in, the, in, in my garden here? Are the free range chickens, the regenerative chickens, are they more at risk than their factory farm cousins? What's the truth? No, they're not. There's ample evidence that animals kept outdoors extensively uh, have a much healthier, much less vulnerable uh, to disease. Let's take this biosecurity point, which the industry loves us to say, our, our factory farms are biosecure, pathogens just can't get in. Well, this is something of a myth. I mean, yes, of course, good biosecurity can help. But in these big farms, people and vehicles are constantly coming in and out of the farm, for example, to bring in feed for the animals. And in this way, disease can enter the farm. Um, the, uh, the animals are coming in and out of the farm. They'll be coming out of the farm, either go to other farms for fattening or to slaughter. So there's endless movement which can lead to the spread of disease. You've also got in these farms just huge extractor fans uh, that, that, that are taking pathogens out of the farm, such as bird flu and Campylobacter. And this, this gets into the air, can be transferred to neighbouring farms and infect animals there and infect the people. The, but the key bit of evidence uh, that shows that the extensive animals are so much healthier than the factory farmed is to do with antibiotic use. Now, of course, antibiotics only help with bacterial disease, not viruses, but nonetheless, it's a, a very good touchstone. And if you look at the data coming from the UK government, uh, the, you know, it's the, it's the intensive pig sector that has much more use of antibiotics than our extensive cattle sector. Interestingly, if you look at our cattle sector, which is extensive and compare it with the US cattle sector, which tends to keep animals in, in these very packed, dirty feedlots, American cattle are using at least nine times more antibiotics, you know, per animal than UK cattle. Uh, there was a marvellous study done a few years ago by the Danish Ministry of Agriculture, and they compared Danish organic pigs with uh, Danish factory farmed pigs. And again, the, the organic pigs were needing much less antibiotics. It was most telling um, <coughs> at, the, um, at, at this whole point of early weaning of pigs, which I, w w which I mentioned. The, the organic pigs are weaned much later than the factory farm pigs. And the use of antibiotics around the time of weaning uh, was 20 times greater in the factory farm pigs than the organic one. So I, I'm, I'm utterly clear that extensively reared animals to high health and welfare standards are much more healthy, much less susceptible to disease than factory farmed animals. Although, of course, any animals, like any people, can from time to time catch disease. I'm not trying to sort of describe a perfect situation. Peter, thank you for that. A very comprehensive answer. And of course, the animals in those biosecure barns are actually in the perfect reactor, the perfect breeding ground for new and more dangerous strains of disease. So, you know, a real lose-lose situation on factory farms. But coming back to uh, wildlife, because it's widely accepted that the wet markets uh, provided the final link in the transfer of COVID-19 to people uh, and the illegal trade in, in consuming wildlife. What do you see as the most effective way to influence uh, reform there uh, to address that zoonotic transmission uh, from wildlife? I mean, this is a real challenge. I mean, I totally support the, the you know, the, the animal welfare organisations that focus on wild animals. I mean, clearly, we need to phase out these so-called wet markets. Uh, you know, apart from the disease factor, the, the, these, the, these are markets in which wild animals are brought in, kept in cages, then once they've been purchased, slaughtered on the spot with great brutality. Um, 
And certainly in the meantime, till, the, till they have been phased out, there needs to be much better regulation, both of hygiene uh, uh, and animal welfare. But we do have the challenge that there are, there are many people in the world, particularly in Africa and Asia, that are currently dependent on wet markets and, and other forms of what in Africa is called bushmeat, in other words, wild animals caught from forests. Um, and clearly, you know, we want to see that we support those organisations who want to see an end to this. I'm afraid the one answer is that they will need to move over to, to farming rather than catching wild animals and bring them to wet markets. We're going to have to work hard to make sure that farming is humane and sustainable, not factory farming. And it is a challenge. We've learned very, very recently that huge complexes of immensely industrial pig farms are being built in China. This is not so much because of COVID, but because the Chinese pig herd was decimated by uh, African swine flu. And so we're going to have to really keep working to, to get the message across about how damaging these systems are. And this is where I hold out some hope. For example, just a few days ago, the, the, the chief executives of three of the big global UN bodies, including the U UN Environment Programme, made it absolutely clear that we need a thorough rethink about how we treat the natural world, how we farm. They're using the phrase, we need to build back better. So there's going to be a big battle between the voices of factory farming and those that recognise how damaging and cruel these systems are. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I was only talking the other day with the uh, the global communications chief of the United Nations. And uh, yeah, she was telling me about that phrase, build back better. And it does resonate with everything we're trying to do to make sure that we have a new normal where we reset the position for animals, the way that animals are regarded in society. Moving from a global to a, a UK perspective, in the UK we have a particularly important moment in history. If you look back at the history of, of, of factory farming, uh, perhaps the defining policy moment in UK history was the Agriculture Act of 1947, which was the piece of legislation which essentially locked in a trajectory for ever more intensive agriculture, ever more factory farming in Britain. Now, a once in a lifetime opportunity is now heading to the House of Lords, a draft agriculture bill. Um, what do we need to achieve in that agriculture bill to help uh, reset food and farming, to build back better uh, so that we start to dismantle uh, factory farming for all our sakes? What do we need from that agriculture bill, Peter? And in particular, you know, pull out um, you know, what, what needs to happen with, with subsidies, because in Britain, uh, the farming community is subsidised by the taxpayer to the tune of three and a half billion pounds a year. What do we need to achieve? OK, the, the Agriculture Bill is, you know, is to a degree unambitious. Uh, it, it sees its role as setting out how we, you know, as we leave the EU, how we replace the common agricultural policy with our own approach to subsidies. And there it's good because the, 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 the common agricultural policy, the CAP, largely pays farmers for owning land. Uh, what the Agriculture Bill says is no, that's not acceptable. And it's coined this phrase, uh, public goods for public money. In other words, if you're going to get a subsidy, you've got to be delivering something in terms of animal welfare or environmental improvement that the public wants, but that the marketplace is unlikely to, to sufficiently deliver. And we're delighted after quite a lot of lobbying from us that improvements in animal welfare is one of these public goods. And, you know, I don't think that's going to be challenged in the Lords. I think the big battle in the Lords is going to be this big, this worry that future trade deals, particularly one with the United States, could allow low welfare uh, meat and milk 
to come into the UK, so undermining our farmers and, and um, our animal welfare and food safety standards. And what we and many MPs want uh, is a clause in the bill that would actually say the UK government can't strike a trade deal if that deal would not, would not enable it to say no to low quality imports. So on the subsidy side, yes, it's, it, it's helpful. It's what's called a framework bill. It's not going into massive detail. So once it's gone through the Lords, the big, the big struggle will be persuading our government that they, ha you know, that they really need to use the, these new subsidies and powers very ambitiously. And my, my feeling at the moment, I, okay, there's evidence both ways. Just before lockdown, DEFRA, you know, the, the, the agriculture government department, did issue a future farming document which had a wonderful section on animal welfare. It was, although the wording was a little bit cautious, it was basically saying, look, yes, we probably need to move away from farrowing crates and beak trimming of hens and tail docking of pigs. And we need to recognise that cows need to be out of pasture and that meat chickens need to be slower growing and need more space. Now, if we can persuade them to really make a reality of all this, it would be great. But I think on the broader environmental front, when we talked about regenerative agriculture a few minutes ago, uh, I don't think they quite, I, I think where they're going is a bit of greening around the edges of the current status quo, rather than recognising this need for a very far reaching change. So like with so many things, you know, some encouraging signs, but a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just moving on to the European Union, where we've been doing a lot of work, of course, we've been running a, a coalition campaign, 170 organisations across Europe have come together to call for an end to the cage age, so an end to battery cages and sow stores, farrowing crates, these kind of things for good. And uh, one of the things which uh, news just in is that the European Food Saf Safety Agency, EFSA, uh, has been asked by the European Commission to prepare a report into uh, uh, into uh, essentially the welfare issues of cages and live transport and to make recommendations for future legislation. And we know at the same time that the European Union is looking at its farm to fork strategy, at its uh, farm policy strategy. What do you think we need to, to get from this period of, uh, of thinking uh, and intent going on in Europe? Uh, I think it's a very potentially exciting period in Europe. As you say, just last week, the farm to fork strategy was published. Uh, and that, Firstly, it recognises the need for improved animal welfare. It says it's going to re-examine uh, the legis you know, EU legislation on farm animal welfare. Um, it, it sets targets for reducing agrochemicals, you know, particularly the use of pesticides and fertilisers. What I don't think it recognises, or, or at least is not going to yet admit, is that this heavy use of fertilisers and pesticides is to quite some degree arising from um, the factory farming of animals. As I said earlier, over half of EU cereals are used as animal feed. And because of this huge demand for cereals, we end up f farming our, our, our crops very intensively with agrochemicals. If we stopped using cereals as animal feed, we could farm our, our, our arable land much much more extensively without all these agrochemicals. Um, so yes, they recognise the problem. I don't think they recognise yet the, the major contribution of animal factory farming to it. But again, they also talk about wanting a big reduction in antibiotic use. Great. But again, I don't think they're quite realising that in order to achieve that, we're going to have to have a, a wholesale way change in the way we farm animals. So a bit like in the UK, some very very interesting possibilities, some real recognition of the problems. They, they do recognise, though again, I don't think quite enough, that if they're going to achieve their climate change targets, there's got to be a big reduction in consumption of, of meat and dairy. So it's our job now to build on what the, the farm to fork strategy says uh, and really keep pressing for, for far reaching changes.
Fantastic. Well, let's we will, of course, keep uh, <coughs> pressing. Uh, Brussels office is uh, hugely dedicated, working 24 hours a day to make sure that we bring pressure to bear where it counts in Europe. And that's, of course, in in Brussels. Um, I think um, one of the things which Compassion in World Farming has been good at delivering over the last 30, 40 years is specific change for animals, getting a ban on barren battery cages and into field crates in the UK and Europe, getting animals recognized as sentient beings capable of feeling pain and suffering uh, throughout the European Union. These <coughs> have been uh, you know, key reforms, hard won uh, battles uh, and we've essentially been zeroing in on the soft underbelly of factory farming, the weak spots, the vulnerable points in the machine, um, picking it apart bit by bit. COVID-19 perhaps uh, f gives us an opportunity for a bigger picture rethink uh, to not only continue to attack those pressure points, the live export trade and so on, but actually to take a much bigger picture vision uh, to, to the world that actually we need to stop all of this. We need to end factory farming and have a drastic reduction in the uh, meat and dairy uh, production uh, of the of the planet. Um, the question is, is there an argument now uh, for taking that kind of joined up approach to make the most of this opportunity where we are having a societal rethink, where we are build, building back better? Yeah. I think one thing I'm really proud of is the way that over many, many years, uh, Compassion and World Farming, pro probably almost alone uh, amongst the major animal welfare groups, has recognised the, the need for a joined up approach to, to make the argument that factory farming of animals isn't just bad for welfare, but that it is what is driving you know, soil degradation, water pollution, biodiversity loss, certainly playing a part in climate change uh, and playing a part in the very unhealthy diets that are there in much of the world. I mean, globally, and including in the UK, we have a food system that's doing the exact opposite of what it's meant to do. It's making people ill. Poor diets are the major cause of disease throughout the world, uh, including in the UK. Uh, so, you know, within poor diets, in addition to you know overconsumption of sugar, salt, processed foods, overconsumption of meat is very much recognised as part of that. You know what contributes to heart disease and certain cancers and obesity. So, I think we 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 have built that picture based on, on endless peer-reviewed science and science, uh, uh, and reports. Um, and it's why in, in my presentation earlier, I didn't just talk about what new, what new types of farming should look like for animals, but also what the arable sector should look like. How do we prevent the use of, pest, uh, of, of, of pets and plant disease, pests and plant diseases without chemical pe uh, pesticides? You know, we, we have developed uh, a really comprehensive picture of what farming uh, should be looking like. I'm also pleased, uh, again, the, the other thing that's triggered off when I think about joined up approaches is we work so well uh, with a whole range of NGOs, both in the animal uh, welfare and environmental movement, 170 NGOs have come together on the, um, you know, end the cage age campaign. Just in the two, last two months since lockdown, we have built an informal co coalition uh, of th over 30 animal welfare NGOs throughout Europe that it, that is working very hard. Uh, to end EU live exports to the Middle East, North Africa and Turkey. So yes, the, 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 this joining up in both senses is, is really important. And maybe because I, I, I suspect time is coming to an end. Another thing I think we've done really important, really, you know, that's really important we've done with two other big welfare organisations is start the Farms Initiative. That's Farm Animal Responsible Minimum Standards. This is aimed at all the big banks and financial institutions, both public and private, that are actually funding factory farming uh, in the developing world. You know, I mentioned these 
huge new pig farms in China. That's being funded by the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. And we've produced minimum standards that are saying, look, you should not be funding unless the, the, the operation that you're funding meets these standards. And this is so important because they're key drivers of factory farming. But it's, it's a sector, the financial institution sector, that till recently has paid very little attention to animal welfare. Peter Stevenson, Chief Policy Officer of Factory of Compassion in World Farming. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for uh, for such a comprehensive overview of the problem and the solution and how uh, you know, we working with a myriad of others uh, across the UK, Europe and beyond are working steadfastly to bring an end to factory farming. Peter, thank you. And, and thank you all for joining us uh, in these challenging times and thank you for your support uh, in helping us to continue to argue so strongly that we need to end factory farming for all our sakes, that the real crux of protecting people is to protect animals too, and that we need to transform what after all is a totally outdated food system. The dark ages of cages have to be consigned to the history books, and that's what we're going to do with your help. Thanks for joining us this evening. We'll be sending out an email to you uh, for, for uh, as a follow up. We'll be showing you how you can take action because we're all about taking action as an organization. Uh, we have a, a, a new take, a take action uh, live now, which is putting pressure on the World Bank and the UN and other international institutions uh, to take a stand against factory farming. Because at the end of this, yes, we need new legislation, far reaching legislation in the UK. We need it too in the European Union. Compassion in World Farming is active in China. Uh, we are also active across the United States of America. Ultimately, what we need is a global agreement a Paris climate change style agreement that we are going to safeguard the future for people, for animals, for all of us, for all of our sakes, a global agreement to move away from factory farming towards a regenerative food system, much less reliant on meat and dairy, where the only cage will be an empty cage. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for your support. And I look forward to seeing you down the road on the campaigning trail. Thank you. Good night.